Good day, everyone, and welcome to this microscopy and analysis webinar on a very exciting field in light microscopy, imaging systems for confocal live cell fluorescence microscopy. Hello, this is Julian Heath, the editor of Microscopy and Analysis, and I'm here as the moderator of this webinar in which Dr. Mark Brown of Andor Technology will give a presentation entitled New Technologies for Confocal Live Cell Microscopy, and he will introduce Andor's new Clara camera, a new laser platform for pulsed ultraviolet uncaging and, and ablation, and showcase the new differential spinning disc technology for white light confocal imaging. I'm pleased to tell you that we've had a great turnout today with more than 500 registrants from all around the world. But before we start, I'd just like to give out some logistical details about this webinar. You should at this time be seeing the introductory slide on your screen. Remember that this is an interactive web seminar. You can ask questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on the questions tab at the top of the page that you are viewing. The presentation will last about 45 minutes. After the presentation, I will feed your questions to Mark for his answers. If we're not able to get to your questions during this live event, we will follow up with you by email. This web seminar is also being recorded and will be available as an on-demand download from tomorrow. So now on to our webinar on new technologies for confocal live microscopy, which is presented by Dr. Mark Brown. After academic appointments at UMIST in Manchester and at Lancaster University, Mark Brown left academic life in 1991 to co-found Kinetic Imaging. He spent the next 13 years at Kinetic and Medical Solutions and joined Andor when they acquired Kinetic Imaging in 2004. Mark now heads up the systems division within Andor and is responsible for systems, software, and market development in this sector. I will now hand you over to Mark, who will begin the webinar. Mark, welcome. Uh, hi, Julian, and thanks very much for that introduction. Um, well, without more ado, I'm just going to launch into the presentation, um, and we're going to discuss, as Julian said, some new technologies that we're have just introduced or are about to introduce later in the year. So in some ways, it's a preview of what's to come. Um, the only thing I'm not going to talk about that was on your list, which I should have corrected but haven't done previously, is that we're not going to discuss the pulsed UV uncaging system. That will be the subject of a future presentation. Um, anyway, I'll move on. So from the title slide, so just a little bit of history about Andor technology for those of you who may not have heard of the business. Andor was started in 89 uh, as a spin-out from Queen's University in Belfast and is currently headquartered in Belfast and has offices all around the world now. Um, and Andor introduced a number of innovative products over those years, which you can see on the slide there. Uh, one of the most notable was the intensified CCD in uh, uh, their, the iStar product. And then later in 2002, Andor introduced the Ixon cameras that have now become recognized as the leading product for uh, applications as demanding as finding new planets in astronomy and also observing single molecules uh, in, in uh, physical sciences and life sciences. Um, in 2004, Andor introduced the Michel spectrometer there. Uh, Andor has a wide range of products in all optical technologies, from spectroscopy uh, all the way through into live cell imaging systems. And in 2005, uh, after forming a global relationship with Yokogawa, who manufacture the CSU-X laser spinning disc instrument, we launched our Revolution product range. And so what I'd like to talk to you today is what we've been doing in the, since we've been building the product range and what we'll be introducing uh, in, the, in the recent past and also in the near future. So uh, in the normal way, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell it to you. So we have here a systems overview. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick reminder about what a laser spinning disc confocal system looks like, identify new components that we've introduced, cameras and light sources, and then discuss the new mid-range scanning uh, disc scanner, spinning disc scanner that we're going to talk about. The new microscopy camera that we're introducing 
uh, the Clara, which um, Julian has already mentioned, uh, is going to be identified, and we'll compare it with the market leaders and identify the key features of the product and identify the areas where it has enormous strength. Then we'll talk about a new light sources or light sources that we're introducing. Briefly mention the new five-line solid-state laser combiner and uh, give a bit more detail on the new metal halide light source that we'll be introducing for general microscopy applications. And then we'll focus on the differential spinning disk scanner. The white light confocal instrument arrives as we see it. There have been a number of instruments developed, but this one has some unique features which we think will make it the first truly successful white light confocal. Um, and then we'll mention a little bit about applications and compare the laser spinning disk with the white light spinning disk, uh, primarily through a feature comparison. So um, this is the, on the um, schematic here of the CSUX, or the, con or the confocal scanning unit from Yokogawa, which is a core component of our high-end revolution live cell laser spinning disk instrument. And uh, you can see that you have a, it's, it's a dual disk instrument. The top disk has a series of uh, micro lenses embedded into it or constructed into it. And below it, in exact alignment, is a series of 50 micron pinholes. And the laser illumination is collimated and comes from the top, through the top disk. And each micro lens now uh, images the beam, the parallel beam, down into the pinhole. And this pinhole disk is now, this, this pair of disks is spinning at high speed, many thousands of revs per minute. And so these pinholes are effectively scanned through the specimen plane. Um, the fluorescent light that results comes back through the same objective, and you'll notice that between the disks is a dichroic mirror. So the fluorescent light is reflected into an orthogonal detection channel or port where we're able to place uh, emission filter wheels and such devices, but also we can introduce electron multiplying CCD cameras which allow us to gain enormous sensitivity from this device. So we have here an instrument in which the background is very low because we have this orthogonal detection channel. It has high-speed scanning, and because the laser beam is split up into approximately 1,000 points uh, for every scan, during the scan, um, we have a very low bleach a scenario with confocal imaging that makes it ideal for live cell applications. If we go on to the next slide, you'll see that we can compare point scanners, which is the classical laser scanning confocal microscope that many people will be familiar with, versus the dual disk scanner. And you'll see that while a point scanner scans individual an individual laser beam across the specimen, the, the spinning disk unit is scanning about 1,000 points simultaneously. The, the, re, the consequence of this is that with the, point, with the disk scanner, you can acquire a, a light from all of those points in parallel, whereas on the laser scanner that scans a single laser point, you have serial detection. Uh, consequently, we will have, be able to use an EMCCD in a CSU versus a point or a uh, photomultiplier tube in a laser scanner. And you can see there's a big difference then in quantum efficiency as well as in the parallel detection. Frame rates consequently will be many times higher in the CSU, and that makes it good for f observing rapid events or temporally changing events within the specimen. Uh, laser peak power per point will be one thousandth. So we get very low bleach rates within the, uh, the disk scanner. And we get very little time skew between the different points within the frame, which in a laser scanning instrument may be significant if you've got rapid events you're trying to observe. Uh, the laser scanner has a couple of advantages, though, in that it can have a programmable scan. And you can have simultaneous scanning with more than one laser beam. Anyway, so that's the comparison. 
Here we have a more uh, a similar objective, but we basically identify the benefits. So we have isolated detector channel, efficient illumination through the lenses. The overall efficiency through that micro lens and disc is about 60%, but overall the instrument's about 15% efficient in transmission. We have low peak power by parallel illumination, efficient parallel detection with a high QE detector and true broadband operation. And we add a few tweaks to the end of the uh, optical chain by adding achromatic detector optics and very high performance filters to achieve very good signal to noise ratios. I'd say market leading signal to noise ratios. So by way of uh, review, this is what the CSU-X1 scanner manufactured by Yokogawa looks like. And this is the instrument, as I say, that forms the heart of uh, the scanning side of, the, of our instrumentation. So there are key features here. Um, so the sectioning ability of the instrument is about 1.2 microns and uh, very low background. So the next slide shows us a typical arrangement of an instrument. Um, on the left-hand side at the top here, you have a, a workstation which controls the whole instrument. If you look on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see a range of different configurations from user installations around the world uh, on an upright microscope, on the side port with incubator, or on a side port in the lower right uh, without, with a motorized stage there. So you can, if you, we work down, go back to the left-hand side and work down here, you'll see um, below the workstation is the laser combiner which delivers uh, up to five lines of solid state uh, individual laser modules. And those get coupled through a single mode fiber and feed the CSUX for laser illumination. Uh, below that, we have our precision control unit, which provides the timing for the instrumentation. And then if we mo work around in an anti-clockwise manner, uh, down at the bottom, we have our EMCCD or Clara CCD detector, which is a great companion for the CSUX. Uh, and we move up then to emission filter wheel, the disk scanner itself, and then up into the microscope. Now, one thing that I mentioned last year in the presentation is that between the disk, the scanning component, the CSUX, and the microscope, you can now introduce a fr our Frapper unit, which is for photo bleaching and photo activation. Uh, there's more about that on our web, but I'm not going to go into it again today. I want to move on to the new components that we're introducing. So that's by way of reminder. Now, when you want to add a detector to one of these systems, because we have the benefit of parallel detection, uh, we would offer a range of different cameras. The two most likely to be used in these situations are the Ixon, the highest uh, performing detector that we have or, or camera that we have, electron multiplying gain, and uh, extreme sensitivity, very deeply cooled and vacuum sealed. Uh, down at the bottom right, you'll see our new product, the, cam the Clara. So these are the most likely cameras you would use in the, spinning, in the confocal uh, laser spinning disk. But you may also use the Luca EM or the, one of the ICON range, depending on the application in other aspects of, of uh, microscopy, such as conventional epifluorescence. So let's take a little bit, uh, a look at the, some of the benefits of the Clara. So uh, in some ways, you may argue that the Clara is not a new product. Certainly, it is a new product from Andrew's perspective. But the sensor that's used in here, uh, the Sony uh, ICX285 sensor, has been around for about 10 years and forms the uh, sensor in a number of, or the, probably the most, um, the most widely used cameras for fluorescence imaging in microscopy. But we introduced this camera at this point uh, with a number of significant advantages. So let's have a look at those. We have minus 45 degrees C air cooling. Uh, we can run this camera without a fan down to minus 20 Celsius. And if you're looking to do electrophysiology where vibration is 
something you don't want, then being able to run the camera with the fan off is a significant advantage. We're able to offer the best read noise in the market, three electrons or less. 2.5 is our typical specification. Um, and that allows you to achieve much higher signal-to-noise ratios, which, as we all know, is the key factor when we want to make uh, measurements within our, our experiments. We have the highest dynamic range, consequently, because of our very low read noise. And dynamic range is the thing that allows us to establish um, very low detection limits. We have ICAM acquisition efficiency. Uh, the firmware within this camera allows us to change the exposure time very rapidly to allow us to do multi-channel imaging and adapt to different specimen fluorophores. Uh, we have an internal timestamp that's generated by the camera internal clock, which runs at 80 megahertz. And so we have a 12.5 nanosecond precision uh, timestamp, which will tell us exactly when the camera exposure started or completed. And then within the camera, uh, we have built in extensive I.O. So we have eight digital I.O. lines and uh, two analog channels as well. And so let's just look at this, the, the interline further note here. 1392 by 1060 by 6.45 micron pixels, three readout speeds, 110 and 20 megahertz, and the camera is USB connectivity. So that's a quick overview of the Clara. We'll do a comparison with competitors later. The new metal halide source that we're introducing uh, would be comparable to a number of uh, products on the market, um, but we have some advantages that we're hoping to introduce with this. So first of all, it has 200 watt DC stabilized metal halide source. This gives us low optical noise and provides very good performance for a wide range of applications. No alignment in the lamp. You just plug the lamp cartridge in, and there's 2,000 hours of uh, uncontaminated uh, performance from that lamp. Uh, internally, you have the option of a six-position filter wheel, which switches in about 60 milliseconds when loaded. And there's a, an internal shutter that allows us to um, manage the intensity in from 0 to 100% with 1% steps. And the shutter on-off time is approximately 20 milliseconds. The unit supplied with two meter liquid light guide. So all of the heat and fan um, is kept within this unit itself. So you have cool light arriving at the microscope. And we cover the white wavelength range from 340 to 800 nanometers. Again, this is a USP device. And the simplified model or the, the lower model has exactly the same performance, except it has no internal position six-position filter wheel. Um, the DSD micro, uh, sorry, the DSD, the differential spinning disk microscope, which I'll show you a few of the features of in a moment, um, is a part of our uh, now part of or will be part of our revolution system series. And um, if you look here, I have a similar diagram that reflects uh, the different components that are used here, but a similar architecture. So it's still controlled under our IQ workstation. And now the light source, instead of being a multi-line laser combiner uh, with single mode fiber, is actually the metal halide source that we just mentioned in the previous slide. And it's liquid light guide fed into the differential spinning disk unit, which I've highlighted here with a red box. Uh, if you look below that, we actually have the internal, the unit has internal uh, excitation and emission filter wheel inside this box. Uh, I'll show you a bit more detail later. And below that, we have the Clara Interline CCD camera, which is the camera of choice for this application. Uh, so the, the device, as we'll see later, requires you to achieve the best possible signal to noise ratio. And Clara is a great companion to the DSD. The rest of the parts you'll be familiar with, uh, inverted or upright microscopes, piezo stages, and, um, and XY stepper stages, um, incubators, and so forth. All the stuff you need to keep your cells happy and healthy while you're firing light at them to observe their behavior. 
in the next slide here, we're just going, I'm just introducing the new white light spinning disc. Um, and we've chosen to call it the DSD. The instrument uses a unique optical design and then uh, image processing techniques to achieve active rejection of out of focus light. So the instrument was patented by Dr. Uh, Professor Tony Wilson, Remus Juskaitis, and Mark Neal uh, when, they w when the latter were at Oxford University. And since then, they've set up a spin out company called Aurox Limited in the UK, and Aurox is the manufacturer of the disc. The distribution of the system and the integration uh, into a complete package is done by Andor Technology. And so we have global distribution of this product, and we are expecting that it will become a very successful product. And uh, as you all know, this team out of Oxford has been one of the uh, strongest innovators worldwide in this technology for many years, although they're all extremely young as well. Uh, unlike other white light confocal instruments, uh, which have, have none have been around for the last 20 years, over the last 20 years, the DST achieves very low background, high transmission, and excellent confocality as a result of the active background rejection. There are two disc patterns within the DSD. There's a 50% transmission and, uh, for high confocality and a 25% uh, transmission for high contrast, which we would expect to aim more at the thicker specimens where background fluorescence becomes more of a problem. Uh, you can contrast this with other products on the market, and um, I name two, uh, the Carve 2, which has a 4% transmission, and the DSU from Olympus, which is a, typically a 10% transmission. So the DSD is very effective in terms of getting light to the specimen, which means you get more light back from the specimen. But you have to use a little bit of uh, optical and uh, image uh, processing trickery to extract the confocal image from that. The theoretical analysis of the instrument ex indicates that it can exceed the point scanning conf this the confocality of a point scanning instrument. Uh, we'll look at a bit of the, the theory in a, in a few minutes. Um, because of active, active background subtraction, the performance is noise limited. So this means the instrument is not uh, going to be fantastic at very low light levels, but where you have medium to high signal conditions, it will perform extremely well. So we'll see a little bit more about that in a minute. So let's look at, go on and look at the Clara in a bit more detail, just remind you what the camera looks like, and show you a couple of images that should have you going ooh and ah. Um, in, this inst uh, in this case, we've got a, a molecular probes, very thin specimen uh, with three fluorophores here. You can see the excellent resolution and the very low noise here that we're, we're seeing in this uh, image. So a very beautiful image, I think. And so it provides the best resolution for cell, live cell microscopy or fixed cell microscopy where you have time to gather plenty of photons. Uh, not only that, but also in cases where you wish to acquire high quality images from spinning disc confocal, then this instrument provides, the Clara provides extremely good signal to noise ratio. Um, in this case, you can see a hippocampal neuron, rat neuron, that was primary neuron that was, um, has been loaded uh, with two fluorophores here. And, uh, um, and this was captured uh, from Dr. Tom Blanpede's laboratory in Balt University of Baltimore um, and shows you, um, here we go, I've got the details here, sorry for that. So it's a, rat a cultured hippocampal rat neuron grown for two and a half weeks and then co-transfected with TD tomato, red, and actin binding protein in green here. So the images were acquired with a 60x 1.45 Olympus uh, on an IX81 with a 1.2x C mount. And this is a maximum intensity projection from a series of, uh, from a Z-stack with 0.4 micron steps. So the red infill in the center there shows you the m morphology of the individual dendritic spines protruding from the main trunk of the dendrite. 
uh, and then the intense green label within the spines, you, these features on the edges of the, the linear uh, features from the cell, uh, show high concentration of actin regulatory proteins that control synaptic strength by regulating the shape of the spines and trafficking of receptor proteins at the synapse. So you can think of these as weighting coefficients in a neural network that's the basis of our brains. So if we move on now to, to look at the next slide. Excuse me a second. I've, there we go. Uh, then this image here is also from Dr. Blampede's laboratory. And in this case, um, this is actually two frames from a movie, the first and the last. Uh, this show this is the a dendrite uh, also of this of the of a hippocampal neuron grown in the same way as the previous one but not transected it's got an internal um, membrane dye called fm four sixty four and uh, this is the image results after ten minute minute exposure to the dye which has been internalized into the cells um, and you can see uh, this is also a maximum z stack you can see bright clusters are endosomes within the uh, internal membrane system of the cell. The morphology of individual endosomes can be distinguished clearly, but the large endosomes do not move over large distances within the dendrite. Uh, however, you can also see smaller, dendrite, uh, smaller transport vesicles um, that are more mobile but carry only very small amounts of the membrane and dye. So are extremely difficult to image. And this was imaged at one megahertz with the Clara, um, and the signal to noise ratio is extremely high, much higher than Dr. Blampede has been able to achieve previously. So we're here and we are both very happy about the results from that. And you can see again that was gathered with the CSU-22. Um, here, let's just have a quick look at the Clara com a com comparison of Clara specifications. You can see, com compared to its competitors, two market leaders, the deepest cooling with the fan on, cooling with fan off, which isn't available on other models, the lowest Reese noise available at one megahertz, and very competitive, equal to the best performer at 10 and 20 megahertz. Uh, not the highest frame rate, because one competitor can run at 28 megahertz. But because of our ability to vary vertical shift speeds in this camera, at higher binnings, we can achieve higher frame rates than even a camera running at 28 megahertz. Because of our low noise performance at 1 megahertz, we can achieve the maximum dynamic range of any camera on the market. We have a sensor enclosed in a vacuum environment, which gives it maximum longevity, uh, 14 and 16-bit digitization, comprehensive digital and analog I.O., and the hardware timestamp, which is the only one available on the market. And the Clara product that you've seen there, that is the entire camera. There isn't any large controller box that you have to hunk around or find a shelf for. This sits on the side of the microscope directly. OK, well, uh, there is another camera that you might consider in very low light conditions. And I'll just quickly give you an overview of that. And at the top, you can see the Interline CCD would give you a very uh, poor signal relative to the Lucra, where you can use EM gain to benefit. But in the lower one, where you've got time to gather photons, so you don't need to go at high speed, then an interline CCD camera will provide you with the best uh, resolution and signal-to-noise ratio. So you, you can take a choice there. Quickly here, we're looking at the spectral responsivity of the two cameras. And you'll notice that the Sony Interline or the Clara provides you with two options. One where you can have an extended red sensitivity uh, just by clicking an interface. And this drives the chip in a slightly different way. Uh, on the EMCCD has very good red response. But in the GFP area is less sensitive, has higher pixels, and probably um, higher noise than the um, Clara camera. So again, you would choose these depending on the situation. 
Uh, I'm not going to say a lot more about the metal halide. I've gone over that in some depth. But let's just have a look at its spectral range. And you can see compared to a 75 watt xenon lamp, it is giving you enormously much more power in the UV uh, and also in the green and orange areas of the spectrum. So this lamp will find a wide range of applications, even as far as uh, using it for Furium, Fura 2 for uh, calcium imaging in live cells. So let's go on and look at the DSD, because that is the newest technology that we're introducing here, or we're discussing here, and we'll be introducing later in the year into the commercially. So uh, just to remind you of the architecture of the system, all run, run under our IQ workstation, metal halide source on the left with liquid light guide feed to the DSD, which has internal excitation and emission filter wheels. It's a very compact solution, and it'll fit onto the side port of any microscope. So these are again the reminding the, the key points of the spinning disk. Uh, I'll just let you quickly scan that. I won't uh, re-emphasize its benefits, but I'll go on to look at how the system performs and why it performs in the way it does. So moving on. Um, this is a schematic of the instrument, an optical schematic, and, uh, and we'll explain uh, how this rather clever optical design that uh, Tony Wilson and Remus and Mark Neal came up with and how that functions. So if we start with the metal halide source on the right-hand side, you can see that we, the beam is collimated and then falls onto a dichroic mirror. So note that green is the excitation path and red is the emission path. So the excitation light finds its way through the spinning disk in this instrument and through is focused through the microscope objective lens onto the specimen. We get excitation of the uh, fluorophore here and if we trace the emission light back through the, through the objective, through the same optical path, the emission light will hit the disk, and the confocal light plus a, plus a fraction of wide field light will find its way through the disk. And on the right-hand side mirror there, I show that that is what we call wide field plus confocal. So the disk puts a pattern into the light, and the pattern uh, that is in focus finds its way back through the light, plus some, conf some wide field or, or out of focus light finds its way back through there as well. Um, now at the disk, we use both sides of the disk. The other side of the disk has a, or the disk pattern here is made in an aluminium. It's high reflectivity and has a hard coating. And so uh, the light that falls onto the al aluminium is reflected down into the uh, other side of the instrument. And if you look at this mirror here, I've labeled this wide field minus confocal. So all of the confocal light gets through the disk, but the wide field light minus the confocal finds its way to the left. So now we have a symmetrical optical system, and we take this wide field minus confocal, uh, and it's reflected onto this image combiner or beam combiner and the wide field plus confocal finds itself its way onto the other side of this combiner, and the two halves, or the two images, find their way onto the CCD camera uh, here, which is the Clara. So we have an, a, a camera which is, has on one side the wide field plus confocal, on the other side the wide field minus confocal. Uh, and we'll talk about how those two get combined um, but uh, in a moment, but if you imagine simply subtracting those two, then you'll see you can either end up with simply wide field or purely wide field or purely confocal images. Um, and that really is the beauty of the instrument. But let's look at the differential spinning disk itself. Uh, the disk design is the product of a great deal of research and trial and error. Um, and here, this is the disk that's currently in use. So it's actually a slit scanning instrument, if you think about it. Uh, here we have these line features which have uh, on the 
uh, top right, we have the high uh, sectioning region where we have a 50-50 mark space ratio or a one-to-one -one mark space ratio with an 80 micron um, separation. So this is designed to be optimal with a 60x uh, lens, excuse me, and projects a, this, this um, pattern onto the specimen. The dark regions here on this image are reflective aluminium um, components so that they also reflect light, whereas the light regions let the light through. And that's how the disk provides this ability to provide the wide field minus uh, plus confocal in transmission and the wide field minus confocal in reflection. The other part of the disk is made on a three to one uh, mark space ratio. So there's three parts al aluminium to one part um, space, or, or, uh, or it's actually uh, um, silica the, 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 the disk is made of. So in this case, we get three. Uh, t three quarters of the light is reflected um, and one quarter goes through the disk. So we now have a different, different weighting ratio, but this allows us to reject more of the out of focus light. And now if we look in detail um, at the, the disk, I've zoomed into the disk here on the right, and you can see the gray area is the aluminium. Um, I've actually said that this is silver, but that's an error here. It should be aluminium. Um, and the slit width is optimized for 60x and performs extremely well at 100x and 40x. So I've identified in the aluminium part here IFR of x. So this represents the reflected fluorescence image. And on the white part, the transmitted part, I've identified that as IFT of X. So that is the image, the fluorescence image trans that's been transmitted. And if you look uh, cross-sectionally at the disk, you can see the fluorescence, the excitation, the green light comes out, gets modulated, and on the return path, the light gets split between these two components. If you look down at the, uh, you know, a very simple, uh, a simplified analysis here, uh, there's details of a more complex analysis using Bessel functions and so forth um, that a bit that's been published recently. But I don't think a webinar is the time to get into Bessel functions. So I'm just going to give you a, a very much a thumbnail sketch of how it functions. So if we have A is 1 over the transmission of the disk, in, ref in the, in the uh, detection mode, and B is 1 over the reflectance of the disk uh, in, in reflection mode, then we can say that A times the, re the transmitted light minus B times the reflected light will be equal to 2 times the confocal image, whereas uh, A times the transmitted light plus B times the reflected light will give us two times the wide field. So simply by changing the weighted subtraction to weighted addition, we can get either or both wide field and confocal images. And if you think about it, this is, uh, for those of you that are familiar with structured illumination microscopy, this is exactly what you do in instruments like the apatome or the OptiGrid. Um, but in this case, instead of it being a static pattern that we project onto the sample, the disk is spinning so that over time we have this dynamic pattern appearing and being detected and integrated onto the detector. And so you have none of the problems that arise from using a static slow-moving grid where you get artifacts that result from localized um, bleaching of the fluorophore. So it has... Uh, some good advantages, we think, over the conventional structured light method. Now, if that was a bit hard to follow, this is what the camera actually sees. So um, imagine that this red area at the top is our detector, and I've drawn an axis of symmetry uh, through it, and I've put a region of interest around these two images. 
So the wide field plus confocal is on the left and the wide field minus confocal is on the right. If we propagate this region of interest and take its mean interest through the Z stack, so actually if you were to look into the page, you would see there is a Z series behind this, and we take the mean intensity in each of those two regions and we plot it against Z or focus, as I've shown it in the, block in the graph below. This is real data. It's not simulated. Um, you can see that the, uh, the upper region or the upper graph shows us the curve where we have wide field. We're, we're simply out of focus where the image is flat. And where it peaks, this is where we move into the confocal region. So there we have the wide field with very low frequency fall off. And then we get a very strong peak around the, the area where we, the wide field is actually, sorry, the confocal is actually contributing. And then the converse is the dark blue line where we see the through series intensity plot of the wide field minus confocal. And true to form, we have something that shows a very similar curve to the out of focus uh, image in the transmitted image or the wide field plus confocal, and we have this rapid drop of signal in the wide field minus confocal. So if we were to look at the ratio of the uh, dark blue, the light green line over the dark blue line in the out of focus case, that would give us the relative efficiency of transmission and reflectance in the disk. I'm getting a bit short on time here. So I've got a bit more, I've done a bit more detail here which you can look at later. you would be able to download this webinar to have a look at uh, in a bit more detail. But it's these two bulges that I've, I've identified them as that when the, the two profiles or the two pixel by pixel images are subtracted, this is the, 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 the signal that gives us the confocal result. And because of our active rejection, subtraction of the background, we get a very strong optical sectioning. So the typical range of these confocal signals will be in the hundreds to thousands of gray levels sitting on a background of uh, out of fluorescence that would be typically uh, a thousand to uh, one or two thousand gray levels. Uh, you know, and this is talking with relatively bright samples at um, 100 milliseconds exposure. The noise in this subtraction adds up. Uh, it doesn't. It, the noise doesn't get lower when we subtract noise signals, it adds up orthogonally, so the noise is equal to the uh, sum of the, the square root of the sum of the squares of the noise in each of the two signal bands. So typically, we're going to have a root 2 increase in the noise because the noise levels should be very similar. They're going to be photon limited or shot noise limited. Uh, uh, consequently, the less noise we introduce from the camera, the better the resultant signal to noise ratio. And that's why the Clara is a great companion here. Uh, I'm, not, I'm going to skip through these slides. Again, they're here for your reference. I don't take any credit for them, except for uh, extracting the key parts of them. The data is, was, is produced from courtesy, well, actually from a publication by Poe et al. from Imperial College, Paul French's group. Um, the co key author is Mark Neal, one of the inventors of the instrument. And now they're moving on to look at other ways. But this theoretical analysis uh, shows us here, if you look at the right-hand curve, the dotted lines show the ability when you, or the improvement of a background subtracted, subtraction technique versus a pinhole confocal, I think a point scanning confocal. So it's actually marginally better. The broader line above actually shows what a slip can scanner will produce in terms of confocality. So this active background subtraction really does introduce significant benefit. Uh, the next slide I'm going to skip on. It's more of the same, really, uh, explaining how they, these transfer functions are used. And then finally, uh, the third slide out of that series, also from the same team, shows that as you move to, a, as you defocus, then the dotted line dropping off more rapidly shows the background subtraction or background rejection that you get from the instrument. Uh, in the next slide, point spread functions are obviously very important in terms of quantifying the performance of a spinning disk or any confocal instrument. 
And here you can see how symmetric and uh, very narrow these these are from a uh, from a point scat from this particular DSD instrument that we were assessing. So the um, we have the high contrast mode, which gives us a, a wider point spread function of po 0.9, whereas the the uh, high throughput mode gives us this 0 0.65, very strong re uh, confocality. Uh, the instrument is not released yet, but we do have it to the point where we're, we have prototypes that we're working with and will be releasing uh, hopefully in the autumn. Um, the, the, you'll see the metal halide source exists, and the spinning disk unit exists, and the Clara all exist, but we're now integrating these into a system. Uh, and I have got preliminary data from the instrument. We would expect there to be a piezo with the system. Um, the unit it contains uh, a three-position filter wheel, which is counter-rotating uh, to minimize uh, vibrations, another clever design concept that the team in uh, Oxford and Aurochs have come up with. Uh, and this is user-changeable, so you can actually slide this, uh, m this cassette, uh, this uh, filter wheel cassette out and replace it with other ones very easily. It makes uh, changing the unit for different applications quite nice and simple. And here's the preliminary data from the, uh, from the instrument. This is a Z-series through plant material, very thick, very bright. Um, but if we look at the next slide, you'll see the sort of very fine detail that we're able to extract and very strong sectioning capability and low background. So you can see tiny features uh, on this specimen here, on the surface of the specimen, as you look at those. So these are actually with a one micron uh, section separation. Um, this data here is interesting only in the respect that it shows us, uh, again, extreme confocality. But also, this slide shows us what when we combine the two sides of the the two images from the two sides of the microscope what the image looks like uh, and it shows you that there's here a, a combination of wide field and confocal when the um, specimen is out of focus as shown at the top left or the bottom right of that series you have that fuzzy uh, image that we're all used to seeing when we look down a, a, a conventional epifluorescence microscope. Um, and we've rendered the one channel in red and the other in green. So the red is actually the confocal um, plus wide field, and the green is the confocal minus wide field. Sorry, the other way around, wide field minus confocal. And if you look at, as we come into focus, you'll see that the uh, balance of, of the image changes to be more orange in the uh, in that image that's maximally in focus, and that's where the um, the green channel is suppressed because it has the minus confocal component, and the red channel is enhanced because it because it has the high com confocal component. The benefit of this uh, of being able to see the image like this is it means it's very easy to get the specimen close to focus. In a conventional spinning disk or point scanner, it's sometimes quite difficult to get focus. But here you'll be able to, to in this instrument, you, you're able to find focus very readily. And you can f click a switch in the software and switch from wide field and into confocal very rapidly. That makes finding specimens easy. If we look at the next slide, which is the penultimate one, <coughs> you'll see that uh, th this is the confocal sectioning from that same previous image, and you'll see we have exquisite detail coming in at the top right, bottom left, we're almost maximally in focus, then we're in focus, and then we very rapidly drop out. This measurement indicated a full width half height maximum of about uh, a bit less than 1.2 microns in this case. And so let's just end by comparing the dual laser scanning confocal with the differential spinning disk. Uh, and as we've said already, we have a point scanner versus a slit scanner. They're both capable of parallel detection. The CSU 
will be the most sensitive instrument. There's no question about that. I think it's ideally suited to electron multiplying CCDs where we have optimum detector quantum efficiency, uh, but we still have very good detector efficiency within the DSD. Um, typical frame rates, the spinning disk, the Yokogawa spinning disk will typically be running at 10 to 60 hertz. This DSD will probably find a home more in the 1 to 15 hertz regime. But the highest possible scan rates are widely different. The Yokogawa CSU can potentially run at 1 to 2,000 frames a second with the correct camera technology. We have, we have customers uh, imaging calcium sparks and uh, calcium waves uh, in the 500 hertz regime. Um, the, on the, in contrast, the DSD has a maximum frame rate of 50 or 100, depending on which version of the instrument you're using. Instrument aperture is 10 by 7 in the CSU. Uh, in the DSD, because you have to use two halves of the chip to provide the uh, parallel detection of the two channels, then the, it, you have half the horizontal res, uh, aperture. On the other hand, efficiency is higher in the DSD. We don't need a laser in the DSD, um, but we would expect bleach rates to be low to medium in the DSD versus low in the CSU because we have to gather for, for a longer period. Uh, both will have low uh, skew rates. Confocality in the DST might be a little better, uh, but they'll be very similar. And of course, if you want to get the optimum sensitivity and speed, you're going to pay a lot more money um, than something more modest. But we see the DSD as fitting sweetly into the mid-range market and providing many customers with a very exciting instrument to do their research. And with uh, that, I'll finish the, the, uh, the presentation and thank you for your attention. Hello, this is Julian Heath again. Thank you, Mark, for the most interesting and informative presentation. Uh, we have had a few questions come in, and we have about eight minutes or so. So if you're ready to take a few questions, I'll, yeah. I'll begin. As I mentioned at the beginning, if we're not able to get to your questions during this session, uh, we will, uh, I'm sure, be able to follow up with you by email afterwards. So, Mark, are you ready for some questions? I'm ready. The first one comes from Laz Amador. Are there different disk options on the DSD for work with objectives other than the 60X? Uh, not at this time, no. It, the, DS, uh, the DSU from Olympus would offer that, but uh, this instrument doesn't. In our experience so far, and we're still finding our way with it, um, the instrument, this active background subtraction, gives you very good confocality even at lower uh, at lower NAs and at lower uh, with lower m magnification objectives. So our experience to date is it's probably not necessary and, that, and right now it isn't available anyway. Thank you. The next question from Claire Brown says, is Firewire faster than USB 2? Uh, Firewire A, 30, IEEE 1394A, is actually slower. It's 400 megabits per second. There is a Firewire B, uh, which is 800 megabytes, uh, megabits per second. Um, but in the end, as you've seen from our frame rate calculations, the limiting step may not be the bit rate of the channel through which you're transmitting data, but actually the readout speed that you're able to achieve with the camera. So, um, so I would say Firewire B is faster. Firewire A is slower than USB 2, but that, that channel may not be the limiting factor. Uh, here's a question from Gerhard Haunert. Are you planning to work with cool LEDs instead of metal halide lamps? Uh, cool LEDs uh, are excellent sources. Um, right at this moment, they're not quite bright enough for this application in our experience, but we are in discussion uh, with cool LED, as it happens, uh, to consider this in the future, yes. Next one from uh, Jan at MPI in Dresden. Uh, are you planning to have a CSU with a 10,000 RPM spinning rate? We do have a CSU X with a 10,000 RPM spinning rate, yes. 
So if I omitted that, uh, I apologize. But where I mentioned two, up to 2,000 RPM, uh, sorry, up to 2,000 frames per second or scans per second, that is actually the scan rate of the 10,000 RPM CSUX disk. Okay. The next question from Guy Hagen says, are you, he assumes that you are using online processing of the DSD images. Can you confirm that? I can confirm that uh, we do both, actually. Uh, so there is a fast online algorithm, and for the highest precision, uh, we can apply an offline method that uses a spline uh, a distortion correction algorithm. It, it's, I, I know Guy from uh, because he worked um, at the Göttingen and, and Max Planck Institute before mm -hmm. he moved to Prague, and it's very similar to the technique that's used um, by Tom and colleagues there. Okay. The next question is from another one from Claire Brown. She has several questions. I'll just go for one of them. Can you, can you comment on the advantages and disadvantages of using lamp versus lamp based for excitation versus laser based excitation? Uh, yes. Um, well, lamp based is um, very cost effective, uh, but it's very difficult to get. Um, lamp light into a single mode optical fiber which is what's needed to excite the um, illumination uh, of the CSUX so it would be very difficult very very difficult although it has been done to use a white light um, lamp uh, for a, a co for the dual laser spinning disk um, but for the other applications there's some evidence that lamps uh, or incoherent light gives you slightly lower bleach rates. I can't give you a, a reference to that, um, but it's it's not a huge effect, but it's but it is but it is measurable. Um, so I think on the whole, I'd say uh, the other point is, of course, with lasers, you have to have the number of lines you want is basically defined by the number of laser modules. So you have to have a combiner, and uh, so consequently. You know, plus the individual laser modules are very expensive or relatively expensive. So in terms of cost, white light has many advantages, but in terms of beam quality and ability to illuminate uh, the specimen exactly how you want it to be illuminated, the laser has uh, other advantages. So it's really a matter of choosing appropriately for the, for the, relevant, for the application, I would say. Okay, we've got time for two more quick questions. First from Aaron Lum. Will you be integrating the new SCMOS camera with the DSD? In the, right now, the, this, the aperture of the DSD is um, matched to the Clara. However, um, there it is, we have not ruled out the possibility that the aperture may be increased and therefore make it suitable for use with the CMOS camera. Okay, and our final question comes from Rhys Allen, who asks, what is the status of third-party drivers for the Clara, specifically Micromanager, Metamorph, and Nikon Elements software? I think we can tell you that there isn't there, if there isn't now, there very soon will be, because Nikon Elements are integrating the Clara. Indeed, I think they've done it. Metamorph uh, molecular devices or or uh, universal imaging, or whichever uh, I should refer to them as, uh, have the camera and have integrated it. And we have written a micromanager driver for those people who would like to use micromanager. So all three, it's a yes. OK, thank you, Mark. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time for the questions now. So this time, I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Also, a special thanks to Mark for his great presentation. So just as a reminder to everyone, today's event has been recorded and will be available for viewing or download from tomorrow. You will also be able to download a copy of the slides, including animations, and there will be a feedback area should you have any further questions or comments you wish to make. An email will be sent to all registrants with all of this information shortly. The Microscopy and Analysis team are planning more web seminars, and we look forward to bringing you details of these in due course. And so this concludes today's event. Thanks once again to everyone for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.